My name is Matthew Vishua. I run the Bible Protector website. Bible Protector is a ministry about promoting the Word of God and that we have the Word of God in a pure form today in English. We want to believe that God and His Word is prevailing, His work is perfect, and today we're looking at introduction to infidelity and its effect on Christianity. This is an important area to understand about what and where the enemy is at, and also ultimately that we are in a victorious position against this evil of infidelity. So we've got four parts to go through. The first part is secular history. So there was uh, originally a philosopher called Descartes who died in 1650 and that is who we might consider to be the father of this philosophy of uh, what is under the umbrella of the infidel religion. And I say religion because infidelity, even though it's made up of a whole bunch of different atheists and agnostics and um, secularists and humanists and rationalists and empiricalists and every other kind of uh, belief system like that, ultimately it's all an assault and an attack on the Word of God. And uh, so the foundations of that, of course, um, go back to the Garden of Eden with Satan, but in its modern form uh, were given life and brought into the world in, in a major way in the advances of the um, philosophers coming out of after the time of the Reformation. Another such founding luminary of their movement is Spinoza, who died in 1677. So these were people that were first um, articulating in philosophical terms things which are the foundation of the entire infidel viewpoint. Now, infidelity wages a ideological warfare against Christianity. And Voltaire is one of the philosophers who specifically was attacking Romanism, but in doing so was really attacking not just Romanism, but attacking all truth, uh, as far as attacking the truth of, of the Protestant view of the Bible of Christianity. And he died in 1778. And so you can see that uh, it's a, a European-based movement, and France especially is the foundation. You see another event taking place in the 1760s, which was the suppression of the Jesuit order. So you can see that there was moves in history in, in countries like France and, and other such places um, among, let's say, Spanish or Portuguese or Sicily or other such places, suppression of the Jesuit order. And so this was creating an environment where it allowed for uh, and it precipitated some events taking place, which, of course, sparked into the French Revolution and into the rise of infidelity even more. Uh, one of the other things that was occurring at that time was the rise of speculative, speculative Freemasonry. Now, Freemasonry as itself, um, you could say, well, that came out of the guild system of, the, of medieval um, times, you know, in England, in Europe, um, guilds of, of common uh, craftsmen would get together and so on. But there was a rise of what was called speculative Freemasonry, um, and that was to bring in esoteric and philosophical ideas into uh, secret orders and so on. That was happening in Bavaria, it was happening in, in Europe, and that was rising in this same period that we're now focusing in on to leading up to the French Revolution. Um, the Jesuit order being suppressed, there was a, a Jesuit and his name uh, Weishaupt. You can see here that he founded an order called Illuminati. Now, a lot of these things are wildly exaggerated um, in modern times. When I say modern, I mean like in, in the present day, wildly exaggerated with conspiracy theories and so on. But if you look at what it really was, was an organization um, where you have people who, and in this case a Jesuit, who then turn to what we would say basically is the principles of infidelity, and in doing so, um, that coming through speculative Freemasonry 
and influencing and his particular people came into Paris and of course that then led to the French Revolution because those kind of ideas being spread um, which were actually anti-Catholic um, yet the basis or origin of of these people and and the movement here you can see actually was from Roman Catholics so it's not like that we could necessarily say our oh, Jesuits were plotting somewhere or or in the Vatican some some plot uh, planning had been taking place in the bowels of Rome somewhere in that time and you know they had this plan master plan are we going to ferment this revolution in France or whatever but um, so that that would be a conspiracy theory but rather you would say well the, the movement of the spirit of that age which ultimately is in line with Bible prophecy it's in line with God's providence that these people where there's a rejection of God um, we have you know coming out of seeds of Romanism having um, come to their full fruit you then have this other thing coming out of it it's like a judgment on Romanism and indeed that's what infidelity actually is it is um, so the whole idea of anti-clericalism and all that coming out um, into the 1800s is directly related to this attack on Romanism. So then you had the French Revolution in 1789. And that was, of course, the fruits of, of this. And the French Revolution is strongly anti-clerical. That is, that they were not only against aristocracy, but they were against clergy. And when we say clergy, obviously it's Roman Catholic, so um, this was a judgment of God against Romanism, because Romanism, um, as as we would understand by taking a Protestant and biblical view is against and uh, is, is a false religion. It's against the Bible. One of the things that came out of the French Revolution or, or direct thing is this um, idea of the rights of man. So it's actually the beginning of human rights and the human rights movement. And you can notice the uh, iconography of their uh, particular presentation of their rights of man ha has this occult uh, symbolism in it so the whole modern human rights ideology which permeates the United Nations and so on all has its real origin in in uh, this so it's a it's a um, it's not a good thing <laughs> it, it's a dangerous thing because it's ultimately not based on the Bible notice even it's like a blasphemy of oh look these are like these commandments in, in blasphemy of uh, the Ten Commandments of God that Moses brought down that are the foundation of Protestant Christianity um, but they have their um, articles of their belief system so it is a really infidelity really is religious and you know when people today they they um, adulate sporting heroes they uh, follow rock stars they live a life um, of hedonism or of um, materialism or of uh, self-gratification and so on really the, the foundation of this is is a religious foundation that is an anti-god religion you know like I can do what I want for myself and all this is all based on this infidel ideology so it's all together it's it's uh, even though of course there's disparate parts of it it's all of one major spirit now, what happened in 1801 and already had happened in 1798 was the French came into the Papal States, they shut down the papacy basically, and in 1801 uh, they made this concordat with the Pope, and the articles of that concordat, or part of what it was all about, was making Romanism beholden to the state, that is to France or the French Empire at that time. So it was basically a demotion of the power of Romanism to now say that the secular state has the power and Romanism is subordinate to the state. And in this case it actually was a wedding or welding together of um, so-called church. Romanism is a false church, a religious institution of Romanism and the state in this case representing or represented by France, the um, coming out of this atheistic revolution that they had, and then um, some of the infidel things. And and in their infidelity, 
in the French Revolution, if you look at like the uh, Reign of Terror and all this, you can see actually uh, they had a period there of the cult of the supreme being, and also they had this, uh, you know, um, uh, they got a prostitute in in there and and said this is the goddess reason and all this. So um, infidelity and and even rank atheism and so on cannot get away from this idea that man within himself is essentially a religious being and and has to have some kind of spiritual um, expression and ju it's just that they might say well I'm I'm there against God the idea of God yet they will still they have to have something as as God or a God or their God whether it's themselves whether it's some kind of mechanistic universal view or whatever it, it's still they can never get away from the idea of some form of religion. Of course, the devils are all behind that anyway, deceiving and 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 uh, so the the devils are fully involved in uh, the attack on Christianity. Another of the fruits down the track, besides of course various revolutions and so forth happening in Europe, um, down the track from that was in 1881, 1882, the Jules Ferry Laws. And they were saying or stating or stipulating that education should be um, in the hands of the secular state rather than just allowing Romanism or religion to educate the children. Well, that, that's a major change and a, another major blow against Romanism, really. And so you'll see then other things coming out of it, too. For example, the doctrine of the separation of church and state was an, another French thing. And that came in 1905. So these kinds of doctrines are coming out of this infidel background um, in, in France particularly. And so the social revolution in English-speaking nations, um, which was occurring in the 1960s, um, and, and you can sort of say about 1968 was like the key time where there's been a transformation in the culture of the English-speaking nations and uh, that is the result of this French Revolution ideology now permeating into the Western nations fully. And uh, so that's a rejection of the traditional institutions, of the traditions um, of Christianity and so on. So it's, it's anti-Christian, essentially, anti-biblical, um, you know, so, so it promotes and, and subsets of it include, um, you know, the, the so-called free love and you know, fiddling around with drugs and things and, and so on. And and all that whole sort of counterculture and everything like that. M more than just, oh, you know, that's just the hippies or something, but to have affected um, pretty much in nationally. And then you can see coming out of that um, sort of the ideas that come from that time, such as, you know, multiculturalism and other such ideologies. They're all based on that foundation. One of the key we'll call it like creeds or um, summaries of this whole spirit of infidelity, it's a spirit of antichrist, um, is a statement by Thomas Paine who wrote a, in a book called um, Age of Re Reason in uh, part one, in chapter one, in 1794 he wrote, my own mind is my own church. Now that is a statement of infidelity is a statement showing that infidelity is religious. My own mind, so it's like I own my own mind, so like there's no God who owns it, is my own church. In other words, I dictate the terms, I worship myself, in myself, of myself. It, it is a very blasphemous, evil statement. Infidelity does not consist in believing or disbelieving, it consists in professing to believe what he does not believe. In other words, it is blatant unbelief. It is anti the Bible, it's saying, I pick and choose what I want to believe, it's, it's evil. And that is what is at the foundation of um, what we might call today in the problem of where Christianity is at, where Christianity sees in the culture around it this pervading attitude, and also it's very much affected into the churches as well, this wrong ideology. So there's a real problem for the church because that means the numbers go down, it means people don't believe properly, they're anti-authoritarian, they're anti-doctrine or theology, they're anti-commitment. Um, so all these are the fruits of this whole spirit. And of course, things like Darwinism, psychiatry, agnosticism and 
all all sort of um, things are fruits coming out of this infidel spirit. Yes, even communism, Nazism, and uh, some form really in affecting um, modernistic um, what what they might term under the term of social democracy or whatever. Uh, such as libertarianism, pluralism, welfareism, multiculturalism, etc., is basically born of this ideology of of uh, infidelity. So it is religious in nature, and it has an agenda against the the uh, Bible. And so there's various different fruits of it, and these are some of the fruits of it. Um, so so it's. When, when uh, people uh, are in the political sphere, they might be in totally different political um, arenas, and yet there will be major problems in those political movements um, on the basis of infidel ideology. Part 2, Protestant history, just as an overview of the effects of infidelity in Protestant history. Okay, so we have um, Griersbach, who... Um, was a German rationalist basically and he introduced or was a, in, in many ways pioneering in textual criticism. Now textual criticism in what he's doing is he was looking at um, the manuscripts in Greek and in 1774 and 75 he came up with um, in, in his work with something called the synoptic hypothesis. Now this is all about oh, what are the source documents for the, the four Gospels in the Bible and other such um, views which came down the track um, include you know who are the authors or the sources for um, the material that's commonly called the books of Moses particularly the, um, the book of Genesis who are the sources of those and they begin to um, categorize in according to their unbelief sources of these documents um, and and so on. Well, this this is an unbelief approach because it's really denying the proper inspiration of God and and that that those people actually wrote those books. In other words, they'll say um, they're compiled from these other sources and etc. etc. Well, this this was coming out of German rationalism, which is unbelief had permeated into the German countries. A another person is Granville Sharp, who in 1798 wrote a book questioning the translation of the King James Bible by inventing this set of rules. And these translation rules were basically, you know, new newfangled rules about how words or things ought to be translated. Well, they're just made up rules. And people today, and this is the real problem, is people who love darkness, who don't want to believe the Bible, who are looking for so-called plausible explanations other than the Bible, like, oh, I don't want to believe in creation, so, oh, evolution is a plausible explanation of me, for, for me, you know, alternate belief system, um, and, and then to be willingly ignorant and to fully pursue that, that's really what we're dealing with. And you'll see it over and again in, in doctrinal debates where one side, uh, especially where one side is is vehemently against the Bible, is is uh, against what's true and right, and they'll stoop to any low because it is a side of darkness. And um, so there's scoffers and, and scorners and mockers and uh, hard-hearted people and so forth. And uh, here you see Granville Sharp was one of these people who was attacking the legitimacy of the translation of the King James Bible. And so that, that was a, a wrong thing that he did. And it was foundationally wrong based on a rejection that basically Christianity had the word of God properly in the past. And also rejecting the, the providence of God in supplying the Reformation versions and particularly the King James Bible. So he, his work was an attack on that. Um, but the problem is that you can see that his ideas were... Um, generally accepted. And you can see other problems come in on that basis then, such as trying to change um, the King James Bible and so on in, in a major way. Uh, another um, unbeliever was Karl Lachmann, another German rationalist and textual critic in 1830-31. He questioned the received text, pioneering 
um, what's called Alexandrianism, which means you know go back to the uh, earliest possible copies, go back to the Greek language um, of of the New Testament, and uh, basically saying that oh, the Alexandrian um, few manuscripts must be superior, etc. So circumventing the entire received tradition of oh, that we've we've got a, our you know English Protestant Bible. Oh no, we have to go back to these particular Greek manuscripts that are called the Alexandrian Greek manuscripts, which is a, a little group of manuscripts of a particular variety, um, which somehow you know through through this um, argumentation is said to be sort of the the repository of of the the real scripture and and other forms are corruptions according to that view well i mean if you actually look at it you can see how um doctrinally and um rationally bankrupt it actually is nevertheless it's presented on the basis of of this rationalistic and ultimately infidel ideology and that's actually what it is another particular person of of many uh, of another um, trend, Patrick Fairbairn, 1858, um, was uh, promoting this ideology called hermeneutics. Now, hermeneutics is just a fancy word meaning methods of how to interpret the Bible or really how to interpret anything written or uh, even anything communicated. But in this case, biblical hermeneutics, um, so he had some sort of rules uh, and and ideas and you can see that the infection of wrong ideas was coming through for example that studying the scripture should be in the original language like as if um, being in Greek rather than relying on your normal everyday use of the Bible that was preached every Sunday at church in England oh no you have to go back to the Greek language and also this other idea was coming through several people not just uh, Fairbairn uh, that Aramaic was the form of Hebrew spoken in the New Testament, which is a lie. And that's only really, um, so, so there was early indications of that belief, but that only really came in the 20th century, really, um, from, from sort of 1920s um, Germany and so on, began and, you know, then you come to after the year 2000 and all of scholarship, you know, takes it as a fact that Aramaic was spoken in the New Testament, and then there's you know m theories that people have about were the books of the New Testament originally written in Aramaic, um, or were they written in Greek, and so on. Now that that's a, a product of of all these ideas, but even where there's people saying, oh no, the, the New Testament was written in Greek, and Greek was clearly spoken at that time, um, or used or known. They're still saying that when the Bible says the word Hebrew in the New Testament, it says it in multiple places, and it has Jesus using Hebrew words and terms, they say, oh, no, no, that's not Hebrew. That's a, a form of um, Hebrew called Aramaic, and, and they make it as if it was a different language. And that's a real problem. There's lots of reasons why it, that's wrong. And just because scholarship says something, it's just like how many scientists say that evolution is, is a fact, well, just because scholarship says something, or they say, well, basically it's an attack, once again, on the um, verity of Scripture. It's an attack, really, on the King James Bible itself as well, because that's what it's all aiming for. Infidelity is an ideological war against what is actually stated as our Protestant Christianity. That's actually what it's all about. Um, it's it's defeated, essentially defeated Romanism. So Romanism has to have... have had linked together, it's linked itself together with this infidel spirit, and that's why you have the Pope saying, oh, Aramaic was the form um, of language spoken by Jesus in the New Testament, because the Pope is basically the papacy, and, and Romanism today is, is largely infected and together with infidelity. And you can see that in its operations, that they not only agree with infidel ideologies in, in various respects or aspects, but also in basically to operate, they have to be in cahoots with um, secular humanists. And that means the connection that they have with the United Nations, the connection they have in the European Union, the connection that, that Romanism must have in a secular society, you know, promoting ideals like oh, peace and tolerance and whatever, 
Um, they can't be burning people at the stake or something like that because that, that's not in line with the way they have to behave now. So you can see that it's ideological warfare is actually what it is. And again, not saying that people are sitting in the Vatican saying, ha-ha, we're, we're undermining Protestantism by uh, this, this great elaborate plot of, of, uh, under, of attacking ideologically attacking the, the Bible or their belief system. And whether or not those things could or would or have or do happen is beside the point, because ultimately it's the devils who are against Christianity, and of course they're going to use any means. But even above that, there is something called the providence and plan of God. And we can expect, according to the Bible, you know, this del delusion of the infidel religion and all its fruits in the latter days, according uh, as we've seen, according to what Bible prophecy actually says would happen uh, about the love of many waxing cold and things like that. Well, we've seen that. And so what we're seeing ultimately isn't the devil setting the agenda of, you know, attack the church or attack the Bible or sort of lots of backslidings or whatever, but ultimately, so it's not the, just the devil, but it's actually in God's plan, in his providence, because it actually sorts out who, who is a believer um, and, and so forth. It's a test. And uh, the church is coming out of this in triumph, and that's the whole point. Another unbeliever was Benjamin Jowett and his uh, friends. In 1860, they attacked inspiration, etc. They promoted to treat that the Bible is just like any other book. So that's an attack on the verity of Scripture. It's an attack on inspiration. Well, that, that permeates into liberal theology and so on. And then you have Westcott and Hort's New Greek Text, which is an attack on the King James Bible, obviously, by saying, oh, you have to go back to the Greek, and when you go back to the Greek, you have to go back to this other Greek that's been concocted by them on the basis of these things. Well, obviously, ultimately, the infidel spirit is definitely behind that. And then all the fruits you have today in churches. People are saying things like, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. The reality is Christianity actually is a religion, um, yes, it's a relationship, but it's a religion. It's a, it's a set of things that men do as Christians. The Bible calls it a religion in the book of James. Another one is, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, actually, the Bible said in Hebrews about um, not forsaking the fellowshipping of yourselves together. Um, another accusation or thing that people say is don't condemn me or judge others we must walk in love and toleration well actually the bible said about judging righteous judgment and condemnation is actually where people do not match with the law of god and are found guilty by their own conscience and by the spirit of god speaking into their hearts that they're doing the wrong thing that's why they don't like to be reminded of that because they say oh, don't condemn me or they'll even say oh the devil's condemning me no <laughs> They're being condemned by their conscience. They're being condemned because they're not matching with the law of God. You know, they have doctrines like, oh, we're all sinners and all this. Another one is, we all believe in Jesus, whether Catholic or Protestant, we should be in unity. Again, that's based on the infidel ideology. Um, it's not based on, this is the truth and that's error. Um, no, you can see that the, the error has permeated even into Protestantism. Um, and in the middle there, you can see faith versus reason. Like, oh, you have faith, but I'm, I'm a rational person. No. Faith is reasonable. It's not faith versus reason. It's I'm a reasonable person, reasonable person who has faith, and faith is reasonable. You see, if you're going to walk according to the scripture, that's where you'll truly be intelligent, really. Um, you won't be a fool. Uh, because the Lord makes uh, wise the simple. So you're the simple, you made wise. So this is the whole point about what the Word of God actually is. And uh, so it's not faith versus reason at all. It's, it's faith and reason together versus unbelief. So what they call reason is actually unbelief. And they call, they think that faith is superstition. No, faith is actually locking into agreeing with what God said which is right, because after all, when he said, let there be light, there was light, um, whatever he says actually goes. Just because uh, in the infidel times it seemed like that wasn't true, that's actually a mass delusion. 
like oh the, the bible doesn't really work healings don't really happen prayers don't really work um evangelism is ineffective they're all lies just because it seems like that or it's been pervasive uh, especially since the 1960s and especially after the year 2000 oh, uh, Christianity can't sort of do anything uh, but it's actually a lie it's it's based on fear it's based on an illusion it's a deception the reality is that Christianity is powerful Christianity is not mere emotionalism now there's people that think well you know I've got faith or you know I'm, I'm worshiping God and they're just seeking a feeling but Seeking a feeling itself is a deception because that can be just a feeling. And uh, so there are groups, um, especially among Pentecostal groups, where feeling religion is taken the place of a biblical view. And that itself is dangerous as well. So, and then they've actually linked into the world and linked into infidelity. Like, oh, well, I'm, I've just, we've just worshipped God for, for, you know, an hour and a quarter, or whatever, in our meeting and uh, oh, you know, the presence of the Lord was there, and, but really, it it has degenerated into some kind of carnality, basically, rather than that it was a work of the Spirit. And we should believe in works of the Spirit. And yes, they the work of the Spirit does affect into the human soul, definitely. But that the Word of God itself is preeminent. That the Spirit of God Himself is communicating something, rather than just people having a Oh, having a feel-good fest, uh, which in itself doesn't accomplish anything, makes people um, not resisting the devil. Because resisting the devil is about the word going forward. It's about people rising up in knowledge. That's actually what the anointing is. The anointing is not merely, you know, feelings and, and whatever. The anointing is about understanding, oh, that this is the power of God. This is what it's about. This is what um, he's communicating. This is who he is. And about actually making a change. So it's not just like I, I had a feeling of the love of God or something. But what actually is the love of God and, and the love of God in practice. Part 3. What does the Bible say? Now we're going to go through a whole list of scriptures here. Starting from 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Well, that's describing in one fulfillment of that is this pervasive spirit of Antichrist that we see uh, coming through infidelity. And it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. So that's that's what's going on in the infidel uh, times, where people are speaking of the world, that's who is attracted to that. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. So notice that. Notice who's hearing and who's not hearing. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So this is the real ideological battle that takes place at this time. It's an ideological battle between infidelity and Bible believing. This know also, this is in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 7. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. How are they perilous? Well, today they're not executing people for their faith in Western nations. No, the peril, peril is infidelity. The peril is deception. The peril is ideological warfare. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because it's human-based. It's like, oh, we have to do all this study or, or we're looking to try and, and use our empirical reasoning, you know, what we see, or we're using rationalism, that is, what we deduce or think, uh, to work out what we know or don't know and make a judgment accordingly. It's not biblically based, it's human knowledge based. That's a grave error. Now as Janus and Jambres, they were the magicians of Egypt, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, 
as there's also was 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 8 and 9. Now, this is a really important prophecy because it's saying infidelity or what we've seen as, as affecting against Christianity to this very day cannot stand. The folly must be exposed. Christianity must have a breakout. We must see great world evangelism and breakthrough for the people of God in the last days. It can't just be our oh, evil is prevailing and, and taking over and the church goes down and that's it. No, Jesus Christ is coming back for a victorious church. There has to be a purging and a cleansing. There has to be serious repentance. There has to be some major, major changes. And that is exactly what the Bible prophesies in many verses throughout the scripture. And this is just one of them. Psalm 12 verse 1 and 2, or the whole of Psalm 12, is a prophecy about this as well. And it says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. You see, that's that's in the infidel period. They speak vanity every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart do they speak. So notice it's ideological warfare. It's uh, There's a lot of deception going on, people lying to each other. That's exactly what we see. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. And pride is a major issue. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Now, if that's not an expression of infidelity, what is? Um, you know, people deciding truth for themselves, humanism, um, all, all of these atheists and so on. And, you know, what's included in that? People who make modern versions and, and come up with different and new doctrines. With our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? So that is infidelity and that is affected even into churches. Psalm 12, 3 and 4. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. That's a prophecy about God uh, reversing and, and outworking to help in for those people who are believers. Psalm 12 verse 5. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. So clearly evil people coming up into uh, Western nations leadership is, is a, a product or a result of this infidel spirit. And, and it has that bad people are put into power in places and that's a judgment actually against it so it's not the final antichrist we're talking about um, but that there's many little antichrists around the place also among theological circles and churches and among christianity you have wicked people rising up and and their ministries being lauded and adulated um, and and that is a major issue as well well the bible tells us that god keeps his words and that God preserves his people, and that there is a coming through and forth in time of his word, of his people, and that there is a vindication for them. And you can see that, regardless of, okay, the wicked are walking around on every side, and it's all bad, but you know there's a victory, and there's a turnaround, and there's many prophecies of this in the scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1 and 2 says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of God, of a uh, word of the Lord, may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. So they're not reasonable, they're not rash, or oh, they're a rational person or reasonable, or oh, they have reason. No, they're unreasonable. Why? Because it says, Therefore, all men have not faith. So having faith is reasonable. But going against the word of God is not reasonable. So they might say, oh, um, you know, they're an infidel, they're an agnostic or whatever. But in fact, it's unreasonable. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Saviour. What's this talking about? Once again, reference to having the actual words of God. It's an ideological battle to try to get people to forget or not believe the words of God or have substitutes for the word of God. That's the real battle that we're seeing today. 
Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, of the creation. Now, that's in Second Peter chapter three, uh, chapter three, verses three and four. You can see that that unbelief is exactly what the infidels are on about. Yes, they promote evolution. Yes, they promote undermining the words of Scripture through higher criticism and so on. Yes, they walk after their own lust. Yes, they question, you know, where is the promise of his coming? Where in the Bible does it say that because, you know, I have a different interpretation of the Scripture through my method of interpreting and, you know, why should I even believe the Bible because, you know, that's just a man-made book or whatever. That's all infidelity. That's all that warfare trying to get you to faint, try to get you to be weary, try to get you to stop standing for the word of truth. Part 4, identifying wrong doctrines. Okay, so higher criticism, what's that? It's unbelief at God's divine inspiration. You see, they say, well, the Bible is just concocted out of myths of, you know, the near Middle East in ancient times and uh Corruption and error have, have occurred through this process. And what we are doing today is just trying to recover the original sources of the Bible. So they're questioning the authorship of the Bible. They're questioning the um, divine inspiration of the Bible. They're questioning, of course, the things recorded in the Bible. Are those things that Moses did in Egypt? That's just myths, they say. They don't believe. They don't want to believe. It's an attack. It's an ideological warfare based on infidelity against the scripture, and this is among um, some portion of so-called Christianity, although mainly you know, liberal theology and so on, and, and what is generally considered, even among Christians, to be rank unbelief. Another attack is the area of textual criticism, or Ale the Alexandrian variety especially, um, which is unbelief at God's providential preservation, you know, that God actually got his word to us in history. It, it upholds uniformitarianism, which says all things continue as they were since the beginning of the creation. In other words, we see corruption taking place in manuscripts. People make copying errors. Um, you know, there's, there's this whole process. Therefore, that must have always happened. You have to go back to the oldest manuscripts. You have to go back to the ones from, from Egypt or from that area. And uh, therefore, that's why it's called Alexandrianism um, to particular manuscripts, early ones, that they uphold as being the most accurate because, you know, inaccuracy comes in through generations of copying. But really, it's anti-received tradition. So they say, well, there was an original form of the Bible, which is true. They're talking about in, on a textual level, the written word of God. It was true when it was written. And this is, this is pervasive among evangelicals and, and even into fundamentalists and, and so forth. This is, this is their major doctrine of infidelity. Oh, but corruption and error in copying and transmission of the scriptures has taken place, they say. So today they question the accuracy of the text. They might say the, the Bible is about 98 or 99% accurate. That's a normal belief they have. Uh, they say that new texts are to be formed. Uh, and by new texts they mean um, critical texts. Uh, or eclect eclectic texts, which means they look at all variety of, of manuscript copies to reconstruct a text of what they think was the original New Testament text. So that's what they're doing today. Modern scholarship does that. New texts are formed basis, based on the oldest or majority of manuscripts, depending on which way they go. They might say the oldest Alexandrian ones, or they might say the majority of what they call Byzantine manuscripts. It's called the majority text. And they strive for more data and discoveries, but they confess that they can never arrive at perfection because that ideology um, refutes or rejects perfection because it is enshrining error. It, it assumes error has taken place. Like, oh, you have to go to the Greek language because error takes place in translation. You have to go back to the oldest or majority manuscripts because that's the only way we can eliminate error of copying because either the oldest manuscripts are closest to the source and therefore the least copyist errors came in or you have to go to the majority because then by taking a large variety, that's like a testimony of what came from the common sources 
And besides that, if you look at many manuscripts, you can compare them together and then eliminate or weed out what are the, the possible errors among them, besides using conjectural um, emendations and then doing all this other cognate and whatever studies and, and so forth and blah, blah, blah. And all this coming together of all the different techniques both in textual criticism and in translation. Therefore, we have a variety of modern English versions and translations today. The whole problem with that is then all the different companies want to have their own to make money and the Word of God is diluted and perverted through this process because they all differ to each other in what they're communicating. Yes, they actually do differ. There's not just, oh, it's all the Bible just being communicated in different ways. No, that's a lie. It's a lie born of infidelity because once you're changing words and translation, of course you're changing meaning. You might, they might say, oh, but the major doctrines aren't really changed. It's all communicated in all these different versions and translations, you know, except for a few cult translations or whatever. But, but the problem is that once you change wording, you're changing meaning first of all you're changing nuance you're changing meanings you, you, and you can see it because they have textual differences between their different texts that's obviously a difference already which words belong or don't belong but then the words they translate to are different and so that's all the modern versions and translations specifically um, original language studies is is today totally born of infidelity um, original language studies in its a reformation form was quite proper. Today you don't see the proper form being done. You see, scriptures must be studied in the languages God used, they say. Really? Uh, so God doesn't use the language of nations today to communicate his word? They claim that Jesus spoke Aramaic and, so, and, and other such um, claims, which then changes how to interpret or how, how to utilize scripture. Again, a major error. And they say, and, and ultimately the problem is they can make the original languages say anything because by that method you can have a word in Greek or in Hebrew and some words are translated a variety of different ways depending on its context. And they might say, well, we should use the same English word every time that same original word is used. Or automatically that's introduced an error. But that, that's a doctrine that some have. Um, that's the so-called uniformity of phrasing. Um, Another type of thing they do, and it's very common, is people get a lexicon. It's like a, a kind of a dictionary, basically. And they see a word in Greek, and they look it up, and then they see these different English definitions as supplied by an infidel such as strong or someone. And then they go, well, you know, if I use that word, then it will make the verse say something different. And that's what I want to say. Or they have a little doctrine they want to promote. Or they say, oh, I'm doing these deep studies and trying to understand what the Bible really means. Invariably, it, it because it's based on error, and the error is not accepting that God's actually got his word to us in English already. So that invariably, they, they go off and you see wrong doctrines and tangents come out of this. And people can make the Bible say what they want for themselves. This is actually a major issue. That's a major issue. So what are they saying? They're saying, oh, you have to go back to the original um, language. And then they say, because it's their idea, it's one of their foundational doctrines, every work of man is subject to error. There is no perfection of the work of men. Um, therefore, when something is translated, it can never be the same. There's no parody. Um, you have to go back to Greek. You can't just rely on English. That's their doctrine. Even though the reformers did promote relying on the translation of English. Um, oh, no, no, no. No, you have to go back to Greek because after all, the reformers went back to Greek. Actually, the reformers went to Greek to get it into English so we would have it in English. And then you stick with the English. But, of course, they're into, and this is a major problem in infidelity, they're into historical revisionism. Historical revisionism is, is basically lying. And that's exactly what you see come through all the leftism and everything all based on infidelity and it comes through in in Christianity as well this this infidel operation so they say corruption there occur in translation and so today no translation can be perfect we must strive to improve translations by collecting data you know the more manuscripts the more information we have the more we can um, understand better what what each Greek word means 
um, and they do cognate studies, etc. So it's all then based on human uh, reasoning, and they might say, well, God's given us a mind to do this and employ in this. Yes, it's true God has given us a mind, but he didn't give us a mind to create for ourselves something which is imperfect. No, we should be relying on the work of the Spirit based on belief. And uh, since in the Reformation he got his word to us in English, why is there this attack on that? You see, it's all about people wanting to make the Bible say what it wants to say. You know, you've got companies that make new versions and translations because actually just making money out of that. There's all kinds of problems and reasons why. Pride is a major factor besides deception. Pride is a major factor because it's like, well, I know the hidden mysteries of the Greek and uh, worship before me because I'm a master of the hidden mysteries. That That's a major problem. Modern hermeneutics and exegesis, um, which basically is saying that the Holy Ghost was is is not and was not superintending over his word and does not or cannot communicate by it directly to us today. Now this is a real issue because whilst it's proper to interpret the Bible properly, yes, the infidel spirit is so affected into the area of interpretation under this title of hermeneutics and exegesis that they're saying, now we've got to find out what the original author conveyed to the original audience. Well, that's, that's a wrong approach because you've got the Bible today. Yes, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Yes, Moses wrote to the children of Israel. But it was also the Holy Ghost. I mean, after all, he's the one that actually inspired the scripture. And the Holy Ghost wasn't just talking to them at that time, but to all the people that would receive the word of God, even to us today. What, what do these people say? And this is based on the infidel ideology. It's based on the spirit of error. Oh, we're far removed from that time and that culture and that language and that place and that mindset. So we have to basically reinterpret the Bible today to try and match back to that old time. It's unbelief. It's historical revisionism. It's a deception. So today, modern theologians must go back to the first century mindset to understand what the Bible really meant. Um, talking about the New Testament. Um, so that's called historical context. So that's um, so in their exegesis, they will look at, at what did it mean at that time. So they're asking that question today. So where does that belief actually exist? Does that belief actually exist at that time in the past? No, it's a present day belief. So notice they're imposing their present day opinion onto the past. It's an evil thing. It's based on the human heart of today, not relying on God communicating to me today, but relying on, on me, that is to say that person, in the hypothetical sense, but that's what they do, imposing my opinion, that is the hypothetical them, their opinion onto the past based on what they think it was really meaning at that time. It is infidelity. It is uh, an evil deception. They also study the grammatical form of scripture in its original language for meaning. So that's the grammatical side. In other words, they have to look at the words and what do words mean and how do we interpret language. So they use that together, then they have this um, historical, grammatical, exegetical methodology. And it's not wrong to say, well, the Bible really meant something at that time. It's not wrong to say the Bible's in words and therefore you should understand language to understand the Bible. That's not wrong. The problem is they're imposing present day opinions about, well, this is how they employed language or this is what it really meant at that time. And it divorces the power of and presence of scripture from the present day and it really undermines and rejects that the Holy Ghost is speaking today. So it's a very dangerous trend and it's born of infidelity. Modern versionism says that God's word must be brought down to a human level, to the lowest common denominator and that the King James Bible is disparaged at every opportunity. Why? Because, oh no, that's old fashioned, you know, we don't talk like that anymore and they have all these accusations against it about how it's hard and everything like that. So what happened? The Reformation era translation of the scripture went into English, but they say, oh, no, English has changed. The way we use words has changed. Our thinking is different now. Uh, so today we must make new translations. We must update the English language. We must make it clear for a modern audience. That's what they say. But what do they do? It's all about perverting the scripture. It's all about changing it away from perfection because they don't believe. And those assumptions that they have 
and the whole attack on it is born of infidelity. Now, what's that? Remember that infidel spirit is saying, "My own mind is my own church." It's all about saying about what is true for me today, and uh, I can decide truth for myself. That's actually what it comes down to. It's about, oh, I love sin and darkness, and I, I don't want to have the word of God tell me to do something. What I want to do is what I want to do. So the real problem is a pride, love of sin, willing ignorance, infatuation with darkness, agreement with modern Babylon, carnality, worldliness, and filthiness in the church. That's the fruit and product. That's the nature of this infidel spirit. So what are we doing? We're coming against that in the name of Jesus Christ, against that infidel spirit. We're coming against that by proclaiming the word of God and the power of of the Holy Ghost. So for more information you can go to my website which is www.bibleprotector.com God bless.